Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to see you all. Would you please stand as we sing welcome into this place to begin our worship service. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath. Welcome and thank you for coming today and joining us in worship. Are there any visitors today? If you are, please signify by raising your hand. Please let us know your name. Thank you for coming. The first time you're a visitor, the second time you're family. Are there any more visitors? Okay, I seem like everybody else is family. It's always good to be with family. Okay. So today, call to worship is found in Psalms 150. If you like, you can read it with me. It says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his mighty heavens. Praise him for the acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the tremble and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that you sent us. We ask that you would come, Father God, and worship with us today, Father God. Lord, we want to give you our best, Father God. So we want to worship you in truth, Father God. And so, Lord, we just thank you and ask that you will bless everyone that's here. We ask that you will bless the ones that are coming. And we ask that you will bless the ones that wanted to come but could not make it for whatever reason, Lord. We just want this to be a high day in Zion, Lord. We just want to praise you with everything that we have because you are so good to us. And we ask all of this. In the matchless name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Good afternoon again, everybody. So this um, Sabbath, I just wanted to focus on God's majesty, on his goodness, um, just his character, who he is. Sometimes it's easy to forget who he is, and when we do, it, it can be discouraging. 
So this morning, I just wanted to focus on his character, his sovereignty, who he is. And not only that he is so big, but he's so good. So we'd like to um, start with just reading from Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter, Psalm 8, <laughs> verses 1 through 9. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings, go back, human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And let's just pause right there. You know, we think about God's greatness, and then we also think about how much he has honored us. It says, you know, you've, you've put us in charge of all of these things. You've made us just a little bit lower than the angels. And sometimes we get caught up in just how awesome we are because we were made in God's image. We are awesome. We're awesome. But God is even greater than that. And so the song that we're going to start off with is called Immortal Invisible, God Only Wise. And it's taken from a verse in 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. And it should be the next. And here's what it says. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So Jonah says we sing this hymn based on that very verse, immortal, invisible, God only wise. And if you don't know it, it's okay. Follow along. And we will learn it and we'll keep singing it, right? Until it becomes a part of us. Immortal true life. 
my favorite hymns in the entire book. I know I always say that. <laughs> I have lots of favorites. But that one, the very last verse where it says, All laud, all praise we would render. Oh, help us to see. It is only the splendor of light that hides you. Because Jesus came, that veil has been lifted, and it, he's so accessible to us, right? And so this next song, we're going to sing about how good he is, that he would sit, you know, they say um, he sits so high, but he looks so low. Have you heard that before? God sits so high, but he looks so low. But he didn't just look so low, he came so low. And so we are going to sing this morning about the goodness of God.
this morning. Amen. Amen. You know what? I feel like somebody has a testimony to share. Is there anybody that wants to share about how good God has been to you? Anyone at all? Um, woo! Yes. Please come and share. You can stand where you are or come on up. I don't It's up to you. Go ahead. Oh, he's come. <laughs> For I'm 26 right now, and when I was 13, I started drinking, and it totally destroyed my life, it sent me off track from where God wanted me to be. And uh, now I, I, I found God. He, he grabbed me by the heart one day, and he twisted it real tight. Mm -hmm. He told me I needed to get my stuff together. <laughs> so I, I opened the balcony of my uh, apartment I lived in by myself where I was drinking myself to death. And I, I shouted to the world that I believed in God. And ever since then, my life has turned around. And everything I do feels great. And all the people I meet and see, I mean, it makes me feel warm and whole inside. And um, I have a great relationship. And... I'm attending church now, which I thought I'd really never do in my entire life. So amen. thanks for listening. Praise God. Amen. 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 I'm going to put my daughter on this spot. Would you just sing all my life? You have been faithful yes. just one Let's more time. It. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> much for that testament. What is your name? Agnes? Angus. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, it's just the, like the song says, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Our last hymn that we're going to sing together is what you have discovered. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Thank you. 
Good afternoon again. Today's scripture reading is found in John chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. When you have it, say amen. It's up on the screen. So <laughs> I'll read it and you can just follow. I said, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, explained Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? May the Lord... May the Lord add a special bleeding to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I thought there was more. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, church. Welcome to this new month, the month of April. April is Stress Awareness Month, among other things. But I wanted to especially highlight stress. Now, stress has some negative impact on our health. And if we don't manage it, it creates all kinds of problems. It leads to chronic diseases, like there is a strategic link between cancer and stress, diabetes and stress, high blood pressure and stress. But don't get me wrong, all stress is not bad. We need stress to be able to function in this life. But it's when the stress becomes chronic, then we have a problem. So we know that if we don't manage our stress, it affects us mentally, it also affects us physically. And I want to suggest that it would affect us spiritually as well. So God wants us to take care of these body temple. So it is so very important that we learn to manage our stress. Before we listen to that video, though, I want to remind you, and some of you know this already, we are doing a series of classes, free classes, to help people who have diabetes to manage their condition. We have a pre-diabetes class for those who are pre-diabetic. It's a one-year program. We meet once a week. But for those who have diabetes, we start on this Monday at 7 o'clock via Zoom. And I'm sure it's going to be in the advertisement that is the announcements that are going to come up. But I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. And if you're interested in being a part of that class, please see me at the end. And so today, we want to focus on what stress does to our bodies and how we can manage the stress. God bless you as you listen to this presentation. You know that feeling when you're driving to an important meeting, but you're running late and traffic is slow and you hit every red light and you can just feel your blood starting to boil. Your heart pounds and your fists tighten. This is the stress response. It's the physical response in your body that happens when you perceive a threat. This threat could be a crocodile, but it could also be in an argument with your girlfriend or being late to pick up your kids from school. The human brain is so powerful that it can transform imagined threats into a physical response in a heartbeat. And stress essentially kicks on the fight or flight response. This response is meant to be a short-term reaction to help you fight off an attacker or run away from danger. The fight or flight response speeds up your heart and lungs, it pumps out adrenaline and cortisol, and it puts a halt on non-essential functions like digestion and sex. The stress response is great for you in short bursts. With a healthy stress response, your hypothalamus tells your nervous system to return to calm. But when stress becomes chronic, it can lead to chronic illness and contribute to irritability, anxiety, and depression. So let's talk about five ways stress hurts your body and what to do about it. Hey guys, Black Friday is upon us and I'm offering all of my courses for 30% off for the whole weekend. 
so that means that you can get a lot of the courses for $46. Happy holidays, everyone. Number one, let's talk about the immune system. So first, stress initially kicks your immune system into overdrive, but over time, stress hormones weaken your immune system. So people who are chronically stressed are more likely to get sick frequently and stay sick longer because their immune system gets turned down. Some people's immune systems get some people's immune systems get hyperactive under stress, leading to autoimmune disorders, allergies, and asthma. Okay, number two is sleep. If you're fighting off an attacker, it's not a great time to fall asleep. So stress interferes with your ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. Sleep is essential to mental and physical health. Sleep helps your brain process the day's events, it helps you heal from injury and illness, and it helps you think more clearly. Okay, number three is your gut. Under high stress, your body initially pumps out extra glucose to activate, but then it turns off digestion. It's like your body is in the Star Trek Enterprise and it puts all its power to shields or weapons, but it has to turn down the lights on deck to conserve energy. So when you're stressed, your body is ready to fight off a threat, not make repairs until the battle is over. So your body devotes less energy to digestion. This, this can lead to butterflies in the stomach, loss of appetite, heartburn, weight loss, IBS, constipation, and diarrhea. Low levels of stress can trigger the opposite result, constantly stress eating to soothe the body. And this is usually something that's easy to digest like carbohydrates, which can lead to weight gain and obesity. Stress makes your muscles tense to get ready to fight off that crocodile. It can help you play an intense game of soccer or walk faster if you're late to an important meeting. But when you're constantly stressed and you're frozen in a typing position at your desk, your muscles can get all messed up. So stress can lead to neck and back pain, headaches, and just an overall feeling of discomfort. Okay, last is your blood pressure and your cardiovascular health. Stress hormones make your heart beat faster and they increase blood pressure. Over time, this can damage the arteries and lead to hypertension and heart disease. It keeps your body in a constant state of pressure, which is tough on the heart. People with chronic stress are more likely to have heart attacks. Okay, so what do you do? Like, what do you do if your body's seeing some signs of too much stress? Okay, first let's talk boundaries. Reduce your overall stress levels by setting better boundaries. You can cut out some activities. You can make time for rest and self-care. You can choose to combat chronic stress by making a clear separation between work and home life. You can delete your work email off your phone or, you know, turn off your phone at night. Stress isn't bad. It's just harmful when it becomes chronic. So take your work email off your phone, make rules about when you're allowed to check your email, etc. Next, rest instead of distract. Take breaks where you actually rest, not distractions where you just Put the stress response in the back of your mind. You can actually learn to notice what state you're in, whether you're in nervous system activation or calm. Watching a show or TikTok can keep you stuck in the fight flight response, but because you're distracted, you just don't notice it as much. Going for a quiet walk, taking a moment for meditation or breathing, those can all actually help you turn off the stress response instead of just distracting yourself from it. Exercise is also great for stress. It burns off those stress hormones. It gives your body a chance to go through the cycles of activation and then relaxation. A 30 minute cardio is great for stress, but any kind of physical activity is helpful. Go for a walk, build something with your hands, weed the garden, whatever it is that you enjoy. Okay, if you haven't tried progressive muscle relaxation, now's a great time to learn it. So this is an exercise where you consciously tense and then relax various parts of your body. Usually you start at your toes and you move up towards your head. I've got a whole video on this walking you through how to do it. So just search progressive muscle relaxation and therapy in a nutshell and you'll find it. Okay, next, you can learn to turn on the vagal response. You can learn to switch from the stress response to the relaxation response with a few vagal nerve exercises. These are simple to learn and they only take a moment to use. The easiest one is paced breathing. You just slow your breathing to approximately five seconds for the in-breath and five seconds to breathe out. This turns off the stress response and it turns back on the parasympathetic state. I've got three or four more videos that go into a lot of detail about how to calm anxiety in your nervous system. So if you search those, you can find those too. 
Okay, I hope that was helpful. I hope you feel a little bit more aware now of how stress impacts your body and some of the things you can do to combat it. Thanks for watching and take care. If you have a minute request, just raise your hand, wave it at me. Amen. Amen. God knows who we are. God knows your prayers. So we're going to pray at this time. So if you would like to kneel, you may do so. If you'd like to come down where I'm at, you may do so. So let us pray at this time. I help me, Father. Lord, we come to you as empty vessels needing to be filled. So, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will fill them. Lord, as some hand went up on this day, seeking a special blessing from you. And we pray, Lord, that that request will be granted according to your will. Lord, there's sickness among us. There's bereavements that we are suffering with. There's loneliness. There's doubt. Lord, we know you're able. So we pray if the hand went up, the blessing will start coming down. And Lord, we are thankful for the, the one that will be going down in watery grave on this day. That you will bless her in a special way. Let her realize that it will be because of you that we are able to get baptized. And we know you have died in order to save us. So, Lord, we are grateful. We pray for all of those under the sound of my voice on this day. Lord, we, may we continue to worship thee in spirit and truth. Lord, we believe soon and very soon you're going to come to take us home. So we pray, Lord, that we will keep our hand on your garment, that we will not let go until you save us in your kingdom. And, Lord, what we have sinned, we ask for your forgiveness. Pray that I will bless us without end and also be with that man serving. As he breaks the bread of life, Pastor Wilson, may the Holy Spirit dwell within him that the words he speak will fall on fertile ground. This is my prayer in your name. Amen and amen.
When Agfan and Tagui met at church, they became instant friends. You save my soul, I just want to thank you, Lord. Amen. You save my soul, I want to thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to return a portion of that that thou have blessed with. You know what I said? A portion of that. God don't require we give him all. He just wants to give him a portion. So thank the Lord for that. Let us pray. We take up the offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to return a portion of that that thou have blessed us with. Lord, we pray these funds will further your cause. This is my prayer in your name. Amen. Stand with me, bring all the tide into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house, and prove me who says, Lord of hosts. The Lord shall open us the windows of heaven. God's gonna open us the windows of heaven and pour us a blessing that we're not gonna have room enough to receive it. What a testimony! What a testimony. Lord, we thank you for the gift and the giver. For you, these farm were for the old cause. This is my prayer in your name. Amen. You may be seated.
bow our heads for prayer. God, holy is your name. You're worthy to be praised. Lord, we thank you for giving us a love letter through nature as well as your word. And I pray that today as we take a few more moments um, that you will speak to us, that we will hear and that our lives will be transformed. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Angus, for sharing your testimony earlier today. Um, it's always good to be reminded of God's work in our lives. Um, Revelation says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And so um, our testimony has a lot to do with keeping us in the fight, keeping us in the race until Jesus breaks through those clouds. Amen. So our topic today, born again, born again. We want to uh, revisit this topic, um, one, because we are going to be celebrating um, our sister's in the back. She has on the white robe. Um, she is our baptismal candidate, and we're so excited. We're so excited when God does a, does a thing <laughs> with us and begins to transform our lives. And um, she, she shared her testimony with me. I'll share that during the baptism. But I think it's so important for us as believers to revisit this text and this scripture often. Uh, in fact, uh, this along with the closing scenes around the cross are things that we should meditate on. Um, we should take a look at each day to remind ourselves that although we may be going through difficult times, Jesus left everything and lived for 33 and a half years as one of us on this planet, suffering, died, and rose again. There's something to this, this experience of being born again. So let's go to John chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And for those of you wondering, I rarely wear a robe, but I wear it on special occasions. So since this is baptism... This is a special occasion. So John chapter 3, beginning with verse 3, as our text was so well read earlier. It says that in John 3, beginning with verse 3, and this is from the New Living Translation, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Then verse 4 says, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus might have said to him today, oh, you got jokes, Nicodemus. <laughs> this is a powerful phrase. This is something that is critical to being born again. It says, Jesus says, you cannot see God's kingdom unless you are born again. So this is a prerequisite. When you go to school, you go to college, um, and you want to take certain classes, oftentimes there are classes that say you need a prerequisite class. You need something that is necessary before taking this class. And Jesus is saying, before seeing my kingdom, before being involved, you must be born again. So we need to figure out what is Jesus talking about because if you're not a religious person, if, if you haven't been through the word, this, this thing of being born again does not make sense. And although Nicodemus was a scholar in the law, and he should have known better. He is asking the question, and it's a question that some of us have. So I want to go a little deeper into the text. 
Um, John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. You see, verse 1 comes after chapter 2, and chapter 2 is where Jesus wreaked havoc in the temple. He came in and he saw that the, the place where non-Jews were supposed to worship and see Jesus, they were trading and selling. It was noisy, and Jesus was, was like, this is, this is not the place where people can connect with me because so much foolishness is going on. <laughs> and so Jesus braids together some cords and he comes in, not meek and mild, but he comes in as, as a parent ready to tear some behinds up. And he comes in and he turns over the tables and he makes the religious leaders run for their lives. He makes the, the, the money changers run and He's, he's loosing animals. He's flipping over tables. Money is scattered everywhere. And he says, this is to be a house of prayer. This is a place for all nations. And the religious leaders were so embarrassed. Like, why do we run? Like, what, what was this about? He said, you know, what's your sign? And so Nicodemus under the cover of darkness, because he's one of the religious leaders. It says that there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence God is with you. Jesus doesn't bite but he just simply says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? Nicodemus explained. Uh, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And I'm sure mothers would not want that either. Um, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of Two things. What is it? Water and the spirit. Human beings produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives spiritual life. This is critical. Humans produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What is Jesus talking about here, this spiritual birth? My... Dear wife, our first lady is what we call a naturalized citizen. Somebody say naturalized. <laughs> Does anybody know what a naturalized citizen is? What's that? Somebody said was born here. Somebody said was not born here. A naturalized citizen is somebody who was not born in the host country. It is someone who has to go through a process, which involves money, a process of studying and reviewing material and living in the land for a while. And then they have to take a test and do an interview and take pictures and send money and be present and not be late, not miss your appointment in order to become a citizen I remember us rushing, this was back uh, either 2009 or 2010, rushing to, to get stuff because the price was about to go up. I think at the time it was maybe four and it was going up to eight. It was, it was a dramatic jump. And so I remember us praying and, and I remember just uh, some nights I'll wake up and say, is my wife going to have to be deported if we don't get this done? Or, you know, things like she was a resident, but she was not yet a citizen. And so she had to go through this process of becoming a citizen. And those, and it's interesting that the things they were studying and doing, a lot of uh, native-born people 
don't know some of these things. <laughs> and you find out that sometimes naturalized citizens are more American than the Americans are. And so I remember this process, and I remember the, the sense of relief once it was done. And what's interesting about our text today is Jesus is saying that because of sin, you don't have the rights to eternal life. Because you've been born in sin and shaped in iniquity, you don't have right to the tree of life. You don't have entrance into the literal Jerusalem, new Jerusalem that God has created and will bring down one day. You don't have the rights and you don't even have the right to access the Holy Spirit. says the process here is you must be born of the water and of the spirit in order to become a naturalized citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And then Jesus brings in this illustration about the wind. Now with our technology, we can see um, which way winds are blowing. We can predict maybe hours, sometimes a day or two ahead, the kind of weather or storms or developments. But the reality is the way our world rotates, we really don't know how the wind is the wind. We just see the effects of the wind. We can see the leaves blowing. We can see when it becomes a hurricane or tornado. We can see the effects of the wind but it still has some mystery to it. Why is it that although our world is spinning at millions of miles an hour, that sometimes the wind doesn't blow? Why is it that some days when things just seem dark and weird, that the wind is going crazy or you're trying to get to a destination and there's, there's blinding rain and blinding snow because the wind is mixing with all this stuff, but we still aren't sure where it originates. And Jesus is saying that I can work in somebody's life in such a way through the Holy Spirit that you don't know when they're going to be ready. One day, somebody would decide that, hey, I'm going to choose Jesus today, and we've missed what's happened before. We've Miss behind the scenes. One of my favorite texts in the last few years has been Genesis chapter uh, 1 verse 2 where it says, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then the next verse says, then God said. In our lives, the Holy Spirit works in this way. He is there preparing the grounds of our heart. He is there working through the situations in our lives. And one day it comes to fruition that once the appeal is given or once the situation presents itself, you are ready to be born of the Spirit. And then we see that physical manifestation when we go down into the water. Nicodemus continues to argue with Jesus. How can these things, or how are these things possible? Nicodemus asks. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal 
life. The parish here or the death here that is alluded to is not the death that people die right now. What he's talking about is the final death, the, the, the thing where everything is over. You are eternally detached from God. What happens now is what Jesus called the sleep in Matthew 11, where he is there visiting Mary and Martha, and he, he, or, or just before he goes, they say, the one you love is sick. Jesus stays and he dies. And he says, all right, now I'm going to go. And they say, hey, he's, why are you going? He's dead. They're looking for you. And he says, he's just sleeping. They say, well, if he's asleep, he's good. He's well. <laughs> and he says, no, I'm talking about he, he died, but this is just a sleep. Because sleep you can get woken up from, but this perish, this death is, you're not waking up from that. And anyone who believes in Jesus will not experience eternal death. It says God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing God's one and only son. What does God mean here? What is the, the writer talking about here? He's saying that because of what Adam and Eve did, we became the byproducts, the sinful byproducts. In other words, if you are pregnant and you are drinking and smoking, it is most likely that your baby will be born with fetal alcohol syndrome. If you are doing crack or cocaine, your baby will be born most likely addicted to cocaine and crack. And so as children of Adam and Eve, we are addicted to sin. It is in our nature. We are sin babies. We are crack babies. This is what has happened to us. So Jesus is saying that I came to this world not to judge you because you've already been messed up. I came to give you life. I came to give you the opportunity to choose life. I'm coming with the remedy, with the therapy, therapy, with the healing power so that you are no longer addicted to sin. It says, and judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who hate, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Um, I remember growing up in grade school and if you were one of the ones that did the right thing, you did your homework in class, sometimes you incurred haters. <laughs> you say, why are you trying to do that? <laughs> You know, especially if your teacher graded on a curve, um, they really didn't want you making good grades <laughs> so that you could keep stuff even so that if you make a C, everybody else is going to do well. But I remember there were times where I was like, somebody would say, hey, can I copy your homework? I said, no, I spent hours doing this. <laughs> you get your homework. <laughs> and so sometimes... When you're not doing right, and I've been on the other end where somebody just seems to be really achieving, like, why are you doing all that? Sometimes when you are doing the right thing, you wonder why things aren't going well. It's because that sometimes you have those who are hating against you, plotting against you because they don't want to do right and they don't want to be judged by you doing right. And this is what happens with sin and with those living evil lives, they don't want the light because they don't want their deeds exposed. Although the reality now is that many people are being so bold that they don't care whether they're right or wrong. They just care if it makes them happy. But those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see what they, that they are doing what God wants. Born again. It's necessary for us to be born again 
in order to comprehend spiritual things. You see, when when you go through a process, education in a sense is a rebirth process. I I remember um, hearing some conversations from other majors in school and it felt as if they were speaking a foreign language. You talk to those who are in computer programming, I have no idea what they're saying. You talk to those in the medical field, and sometimes you'll talk to your doctor, and you're like, oh, what are you talking about? What are you saying? They start using all these terms, and I, don't, I, I learned from a lady at one of my, my former churches. Uh, she was a doctor, but in each of our meetings, she would always ask questions. She said, what do you mean, pastor? What are you talking about? <laughs> And so when I'm at the doctor, if I don't understand, I say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? So for, for many of us who went to school or things, we, we develop these terminology. Sometimes there were members who say, Pastor, what are you talking about? <laughs> because I'm using terms that I'm used to, but because they have not experienced this educational rebirth, they don't get what I'm saying. And so the same thing for us when we try to pick up God's word, unless the Holy Spirit is breathing life into it, we're not going to get what God is really saying to us. There are many Bible scholars who are atheists. And they write these theses and they treat the Bible as just another literary text. I remember a relative of mine was searching and I said, you have to make sure that the scholar is somebody who believes that you're studying, (laughs) that you're that you're looking at, because it's not the same. And there are those who are treating it as a text and they've discounted miracles and they discounted much like the Sadducees, the supernatural elements that God presents in the world. And so being born again says that now I, I can experience an understanding and a strength to life that I never could before. This rebirth sets us in right standing with God. This rebirth makes us congruent or, or makes us in harmony with God and his kingdom. Without it, we won't connect. The rest of John chapter 3 talks about um, the ministry of John and how it seemed to now be dwindling because Jesus' ministry is ascending. And so John's disciples came to, to John and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan. The one you identified as Messiah is also baptizing people. Everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. They are demonstrating that they have not been born again because they just said the person you identified as the Messiah is baptizing people and everybody's going to him. Don't you want everybody (laughs) to go to him? Shouldn't you be going to him? He is the Messiah. He's the one that's come to save the world. But they are, 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 are being jealous because now that the crowds are dwindling and going to Jesus, what is John going to do? What does that mean for them? John replies, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. (laughs) And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. This is the attitude that must come after rebirth. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven 
and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe him when he tells them or what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he, he is sent by God. He speaks God's words. For God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. God is angry at sin, much like there are those who have T-shirts that say expletive cancer. <laughs> God detests sin. He hates it with a passion because it destroys the life he made. It was never God's intention for us to experience death, but because our parents listened to a serpent who said that they could know good and evil, <laughs> that they could be like God, even though God had given them this planet to, to rule and govern. We are now condemned to die, but God comes much like... <laughs> They used to come back in the day, the extreme home makeover. He comes and he says, hey, I'm here to give you a new life and a new, new home. But I've got to destroy this old one. I never, ever saw any of those people who were getting a new house run off their vacation and run back into the house holding on as they were trying to destroy the house. I never saw it. I never saw anybody leave the vacation. I never saw anybody try to stay there and hold on to the old house that was damaged or mildewed or crumbling or, or almost condemned. I never saw it. But so many of us seem to be trying to cling to the old life. We seem to be like John's disciples saying, hey, the Messiah is here trying to do something, but it's taken away from my shine. <laughs> the Messiah is trying to do something, but he, he's, he's minimizing my joy in this, this darling sin over here. <laughs> but when we are born again, the directive becomes, let Jesus increase and let me decrease. Let him shine in my life. Let him be glorified. Let him season my life. Let him flavor my life. Let me let him lead me me so that God becomes glorified that God becomes the one who is exalted in my life being born again is like being born it is a lifelong journey with God once you are born again it does not mean that you're going to know how to do everything and do everything like a grown adult would. What it does mean is that you're committed to let God be your father and mother. Let God raise you. Let God teach you. That you allow him to discipline you. That you allow him to empower you. That you are welcoming the gift, the down payment, the promise of things to come. One of the powerful texts in John 3 says of Jesus, for he is sent by God. He speaks the word of God, for God gives him the spirit without limit. Until the day of Pentecost, only a few human beings had the pleasure of being filled with the spirit. It was usually the prophets or prophetesses that God sent. It wasn't until Jesus came and literally paid with his blood that the Holy Spirit now was given to God's people. They had access to eternal power. <sighs> Got to be honest with you that often believers struggle. 
that often children of God go through a difficult time, including the preachers, where life be life in. <laughs> Adulting just, you know. I remember being in a prayer meeting, and I, I, I think I've said it a few times, but I remember being in a prayer meeting, and I, I confessed to those there. I said, hey, you know, I just want to get to a place <laughs> where I, I, found, I find the rhythm of life where everything works, <laughs> where, where, where I've, <laughs> I've, got my, <laughs> I've got my spirituality, I've got the rhythm of life down. And, and those 20 years my senior just chuckles at Pastor, we still don't have it down. <laughs> we, we still don't have this, this thing of life down. And there are moments and there are times in your experience where it feels as if you are not living in the abundant life Jesus talked about. I propose to you that oftentimes this is happening because we are not allowing Jesus to increase. Oftentimes when we are stressed and pressured, we will go to that favorite movie, that favorite video game, that favorite person. And although those things are, are good and should be a part of um, bringing you around or bringing relief, Jesus needed friends too. Our first thing needs to be coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I need you and I need Jesus to increase in me. When, we, when we're sick, um, there are sometimes medications that we take now and they usually taste good. But when I was growing up, <laughs> when I was growing up, unfortunately, things were so that, that oftentimes if you were poor or you were a minority, you didn't always receive the same treatment as everybody else from the doctors. They thought you were stronger or, or this or that. And so things didn't always work out as well for you. And so natural remedies were <laughs> a part of growing up um, from golden seal, echinacea, ginger ale. <laughs> you know, these, these, these things were brought about. And I remember um, my, my mother would sometimes give us golden seal straight. And um, if you've ever smelled it or had it, it is one of the most challenging things. You almost want to stay sick. Instead of taking some of these, these remedies. And um, although they were difficult things, oh yeah, cotton liver oil as well. And although they were difficult things, if you took them or if you made them a part of your regular diet, you are not sick long or you avoided sickness. But they were not always pleasant. Sometimes, as a believer, everything isn't going to taste good. As a believer, everything's not going to feel good. Much like the belt to my behind did not feel good, but it corrected my ways. <laughs> I have to tell you a couple of stories another time. But the reality is, is that being born again means that although I have to experience challenges and difficulty and discipline like everyone else, I now have a father who's given me access to himself and to his spirit and who laid down, an older brother who laid down his life for me. So that when I'm experiencing difficult times, I know <laughs> that what's happening with me and to me is because God is for me. I got to say that again. <laughs> I know that what is happening to me that I'm experiencing, that I'm going through is because God is now for me. 
So I want to encourage us. If you've never been born again, and that Greek term not only means born again, but born from above. If you've never experienced that, that's your opportunity to experience that today. If you have, and you've lost that connection, I encourage you to do it again. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus laying down his life for us, for shedding his blood for us. Thank you that he got up and is coming again. Lord, because of what he's done, we're now able to be born again and born from above. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will do his work. Those who need to come to you for the first time, I pray that you will pursue them, that they will open up their hearts to you and allow you to come in and that they will claim the salvation that you offer. Lord, I pray that those of us who are in the faith, that we'll renew our commitment to you, that we will allow you to reign in us today. Lord, forgive us of our sins, of our shortcomings. But thank you for not leaving us in condemnation, but offering us this gift of life in Jesus. Lord, I pray I pray that we receive you again and that we receive you for the first time. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.
um, going over the baptismal vows with uh, Sister Olivia Gill. So this morning or this afternoon, um, I've put it, I've put our vows on the screen so you can see it with me as, um, as I say it. And then after each one, you'll say uh, yes or I do. And I purposely didn't give a particular appeal because um, as these vows are being read, I want you to have this conversation with the Lord. And if after we've done these vows, you too want to make that commitment, you can come forward and connect with us. So there are 13 baptismal vows. These are the simplified vows. And number one says, I believe in God the Father, his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Number two says, I accept the death of Jesus to pay for my sins. Number three, I accept the new heart Jesus gives, in, and gives me in place of my sinful heart. I believe that Jesus is in heaven as my best friend and that he gives me the Holy Spirit so that I can obey him. I believe God gave me the Bible as my most important guidebook. By God living in me, I want to obey the Ten Commandments, which includes a, the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. I want to help as many people as possible be ready for the soon coming of Jesus. I believe God gives special abilities. I love the way this is put. I believe God gives his people special abilities and that the Holy and that the spirit of prophecy is given to his chosen people. I want to help God's church with my influence, effort, and money. I want to take good care of my body because the Holy Spirit lives there now. With God's power, I want to obey the basic principles of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And number 12, I want to be baptized to show how pe show people I am a Christian. I was thinking there that baptism, this word baptized means submerged, to go under. So when somebody uses the term baptism, it is talking about submersion. And number 13 says that, I want to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I believe this church has a special message to give to the world. Amen. Um, I think our clerk might be downstairs, but um, in lieu of that, somebody can make a motion that we open our church business session so we can accept yes. Is there a second? All in favor? Um, somebody may make the motion to accept Sister Olivia Gill into fellowship of our church after baptism today. There's been motion. Is there a second? Are we ready for the question? Or is there a question? All right. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> there is... Um, Amen. It is unanimous. Um, so uh, will somebody like to make a motion as we close our business session? So move. Is there a second? All in favor? <laughs> All right. Well, upon baptism, right after we close out here, um, we're going to congratulate Sister Gill. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll have a special package for her. Um, so you may be seated. So we're going to share a couple of things. We're going to dismiss everyone, but then we're going to head downstairs for our baptism. So just a reminder, those who did register for um, this event, uh, I went last night, caught some of it. Um, 
This is going on today, I think, up until 7 or so. Um, so if you register, please, um, after the baptism, make your way there. Um, just a reminder that the LRC Marriage Retreat is coming up in a couple of weekends um, on April 19th through 21st. If you were planning to go or you're going, um, hopefully you've registered. I'll leave this here just a couple of moments here. Um, this is um, to get you to the information for registration. Pathfinders is today um, after baptism. <laughs> so it says two year, but right after baptism um, is when we will, we will pray. But let's stand for our closing prayer. And then hopefully most, if not all of you, can join us downstairs. Dear God and Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your kindness, for your love and mercy to us. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come into our hearts and our lives and that we choose you anew, that we allow ourselves to grow in your grace if we've been born again. And if we haven't been, help us to open our hearts to you so that you can have your way in us. Lord, we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.